So you may be familiar with my previous books, Introduction to Financial Modeling and Continuing Financial Modeling, which have been done in Excel. And these covered how to model in Excel, but time's moving on. I want to talk about Power BI. It's becoming more versatile and more powerful every month. What I want to do is show you how you can build a financial model in Power BI. That is connecting the income statement, where the profits are, with the cash flow statements, with the balance sheet, which is a state of your net worth at a point in time. If we can do this, we can drill down and show customer profitability. We can look at uh, asset management, look at cash flow per month per particular product, things that you can't do in Excel because you just don't have the dimensions. They say if you're going to introduce a brand new concept, then you should start with a key executive summary, i.e. start at the end. So I've always wanted to say this. Here's something I prepared earlier. Let me explain what I've got here. I've got an income statement, a cash flow statement, and a balance sheet, my three-way integrated financial statement balance sheets down below. When we actually build this model up from scratch, obviously I don't have time to do it all in this session. You go in the order of income statement, cash flow statement, and balance sheet. We've got here an income statement. You can see over to the side, I've also got a gross margin, which is currently set at 40%. The gross margin being the percentage of gross profit you get when you divide it by revenues. I've got showing at the moment 2021 and I've got quarters one two three and four showing January to December if I've done this in power bi yes you can do this with a summit and things like that in excel but I can expand all down one level in the hierarchy by clicking these buttons it's breaking it down by day or I can drill up and go for into the quarters of the year instead or even the years themselves isn't that powerful? You could always drill down on particular products. You could also drill down on particular geographic regions. I could go over here and do what if analysis and pick 60% or 70% for my gross margin. And not only will the income statement change, it would actually affect the cash flow statement and the balance sheet as well. That's pretty cool, don't you think? Yes, you can build these financial statements in Excel. Uh, where you can actually have the, the income set, the p and cash flow, but you've only got so many dimensions that you can actually change. You can write funky formulas to use uh, with some if and things like that to uh, collapse and expand as you see fit for particular things, but you can't drill down in as many dimensions as you can in Power BI. That's the point here. That's the issue that I'm trying to make. And I've got in here all three and I can build these matrices. So you can see here, I've got the balance sheet down at the bottom here, just to prove it's here. And it balances. I've got my total current assets, non-current assets, give me my total assets and my current liabilities and non-current liabilities, give me my total liabilities, giving me net assets. And you can see this balances with the balance sheet and you can put this all together in Power BI. Now, matrix visuals aren't necessarily the most used things in Power BI, and they can be awkward to put together, as I'll show in a few minutes, but you can make your numbers look all beautiful here, and people say, oh, red font, lines, how do you do that? Well, that's what I'm going to do with this particular session now. I'm going to backtrack. This is the end, but I can build it all up from scratch. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you some key salient points, starting at the beginning and doing a bit to show how you put this together. And pretty much I'm going to build up the revenue, the cost of goods sold and the gross profit and show you how it all comes together using something called control accounts as well. But getting a bit ahead of myself, let's go back to the beginning. Now to do this, I'm going to have a quick demo file that's got various tables in it. And um, if you actually have a look at the Power Query Editor I'm displaying here, on the left hand side in the Queries pane, you can see various tables in here. We've got source data down uh, here uh, towards the bottom in one of the folders. This is a reference source data query that subsequent uh, queries will reference. We've got actuals. This is the table that houses all the data, all the actual and historical data that we're going to use to interrogate and produce our measures and produce our outputs. There's other tables that are in here for completeness that we're not going to look at. We need a calendar table with contiguous dates so that we can do time series analysis. And we've got two other tables in here, control account measures and financial statement measures. We created a file path parameter, which has got the current value of excitingly C colon source data dot XLSX. Let's think about creating parameters. Go to the Home tab and click on the Manage Parameters button up here. And there's a drop down. We can go Manage, Editor, etc. We're just going to click on Manage. And it brings up the Manage uh, Parameters dialog. And we can click New. And we can name things. And this is what we're going to do. We're going to call it P, the P is a highlight to actually show it's a parameter. I'm going to go for days payable. Um, it is required 
and I'm going to actually have this as the data type, some more number. We are going to have a current value in here of 40. So it's suggested value. It, it can be anything, but we're going to go for 40. So I'm going to create data receivable, we'll spot the pattern. Again, we'll make it a decimal number. We'll have a current value of 45. Now, let's just be clear what I mean by this now. What the days payable meant was to say how long it was between receiving a bill and paying it. Days receivable is a case of how long it takes between actually making a sale, invoicing, and getting the cash in. Let's put another one in now, and we're going to have something called P underscore sales code. Now, the P underscore sales code is a parameter that's required because we've got in the actuals table, we've got the account codes. So in this one, though, the account code field is actually of the text data type. So that's what we'll put in here, and we'll have a current value here of 1,000, which is what it is. And once we've done those three, we've put them in. I'm going to click OK. It's put them in at the bottom in the other queries section of the queries pane. And look at it as well. It's put the numbers next to it of what the present values are. So we've got P days payable of 40, P days receivable of 45, and P underscore sales code 1,000. I'm just going to drag them all up and put them into the parameters grouping. And notice as well what I'm doing here is I'm right-clicking so that I can can actually not have them italicized but I'm going to enable loads so that they are loaded to the model because I'm going to need them and then we'll hit close and apply and bring them back into Power BI desktop and lo and behold they're all in here let's uh, create our first measure so I'm going to click on the new measure button and then go into the formula bar and type in sales equals and then I'll just put on the next line start typing it in get calculate uh, to bring this in, so we'll go calculate as our expression for context modified by filters. And we're going to go for sum for an aggregation. We're going to go down to our actuals amount, is what we want to sum. So that's going to be our field. And the filter we're going to put in here is, is going to be for the uh, actuals account number equals, and I said before, it's the code number 1000. Now notice I'm putting 1000 in in text because I told you it is a text data type, but I've already created the parameter just a moment or two ago, P underscore sales code. So I'm going to use that, which is doing exactly the same thing as saying I've got 1000. Now I'll put a close bracket on the fifth line, final, just do the tick to just make sure it's all happy. Notice it puts this into the uh, actuals uh, table. Let's put it there. We can change it to somewhere else should we wish. And we're going to move it to the control account measure table, as you can see in the top left hand corner in the home table. So it's moved it to over there. And so we've, we're housing our control account measures in one place. I'd already got a placeholder measure in here. Now I'm going to insert a matrix grid, which I'll just make a bit bigger so we can see it and uh, just centralize it here. And I'm just going to drop my sales measure in here. So I've got 1786912. Now I'm going to go in here and drag my date hierarchy from the calendar table into columns in here. And you can see I've got 2021, 20, 22, etc. in here. And I can drill down using these buttons to expand further and further down. So I can even go down to the month, etc. I'm looking here, I've got quarters and months, and it's all looking good. Right, let's create another new measure anyway. So that's the first one sorted out. So my next measure I'm going to put in here is going to be called sales, sales cash receipts uh, equals. And then what we're going to do this time, it's going to be another calculate whenever we're doing things out of context. So it's going to equal minus the sales. So uh, this will become clear what I'm negating in a moment. And then we're going to go and use the date add function. So what the date add function does is it actually it adds or removes number of days, weeks, months, quarters, whatever. We have to have a date field for it and we always use calendar date. So that's a date field in the calendar table, which has got all the consecutive contiguous dates with no duplicates in it. That's what we put in here. And what we're going to say is we're going to go minus P days receivable. So what it's going to do is it's going to go back the number of days receivable and we put comma day in to parameterize it so that we actually have the number of uh, days receivable we're looking back. So if it's uh, 45 days ago, it would mean that we are looking back 45 days ago for the sales. If it was 40 days ago, it'd be 40 we put in there because it's saying go backwards with it negative for the number of days and if it was a positive number it would mean look forward and then we close the brackets and this is giving us our sales cash receipts I want to just drag that into the matrix as well and you can see we get the sales cash receipts and sales next to each other and I'm just going to click on the format uh, button in here first of all I'm going to turn the subtotals off as we're creating our own totals so I'll just turn column subtotals and the row subtotals off 
and go down to the values section and just you know, say actually I want this on rows and that makes it a lot more sense now it's more like a pivot table type approach which is what you want for the matrix we've got sales and sales cash receipts in here so they're the actual numbers for those periods now what I want to do next is I want to create some running totals so I'm going to go and add yet another new measure and this one is going to be we're going to work out our cumulative sales this will become clear why we need this in a minute equals Yet again, we're doing this out of context, so we're going to start with the calculate function and we're going to use the sales measure, hence we don't need to actually put the table name in, so it's just sales in square brackets. I'm going to use the filter function to filter and I want to, first of all, bring back all the dates in in case any of them have been filtered out for one way or another. So it's all calendar dates, so everything in the date field of the calendar table. And then what we're going to do is we're going to say, right, uh, this is going to be subject to the fact that the date field in the calendar table is less than or equal to the maximum. So we'll use the max function of calendar date. And what that's going to mean is all dates less than or equal to the calendar date that's in the matrix there. So that's what we're doing here. And then what we'll do is we'll just put, close our brackets twice, put it and house it in the control account measures table. And then I'm going to make a copy of this particular measure because I've got to do another cumulative one for sales cash receipts. Go in here. I've just pasted it in control V and I'm going to change the name from sales cumulative to sales cash receipts cumulative. The calculate this time is not going to be on the sales actual uh, measure. It's going to be on the sales cash receipts, but then the rest of it's all the same. So we can go and tick the little arrow again and we've added these two new cumulative measures in here and you can see that they've both been put into the control account measure table over on the right hand side and I'm just dragging those into the values section in the visualizations pane and you'll see that's populating the matrix so we've now got in here sales and sales cumulative next to each other and sales cash receipts and sales cash receipts cumulative next to each other so it becomes clearer how they've been summed up and that's that's why we've needed to do these. Uh, now knock those out so you can see what they're there for. So we've got this, just the sales and the sales cash receipts. And let's create yet another measure now, another new measure. And this one's going to be called sales opening receivables. What a control account is, is it actually tells you for the balance sheet, which is where you were basically showing your assets, your liabilities and your equity. For sales, what's going to happen here is we're going to have started off with our opening receivables or debtors, what we're owed. We're going to have our sales for the period and then we're going to have our cash receipts received, assuming no bad debts, that will give us our closing receivable. So that's why we're putting in here, we're creating our actual opening receivables. So let's let me carry on here, just going through. So we're going to hit calculate and I'm going to go in here and look at my actual measures, put the square bracket in. It's going to be sales cumulative plus and then I'm going to put my sales cash receipts cumulative. So they're the numbers I was showing you before. That's why we needed them. And that's going to be, uh, we'll go here for the previous day and the previous day of calendar date. We always use calendar date as our actual date field uh, because that's the one we've marked as our calendar table. Then we close that. So that's going to give us our balance up to and including yesterday. And that doesn't matter whether or not we actually are doing this for a monthly model, a weekly, a quarterly, whatever. We always want it for yesterday, the final day before, because this is something that's got to be calculated on a daily basis. It's guess what? We're going to do another new measure. Guess what this one is? We're going to do depreciation. No, we're not going to do depreciation. It's going to be sales closing receivables that we're going to do next. It's going to be sales closing receivables equals, and this is simply going to equal the sales opening receivables. The first line plus sales plus can you guess what's coming next sales cash receipts that's right oh you must have done this before and so we drag that in here and we have a control account here where we've got our opening receivables plus our sales less our cash receipts now you can see why it's negative and we can see we've got it looking and making sense now time to do some housekeeping now so we can find these when we have loads and loads of measures in here. Now with them all selected, I'm going to format them. I'm going to go down to the format section. Now at the moment, I can't change from general to custom. I have to change first to a format which has a format mask. I'm choosing currency here and then I move to custom. Well done, Power BI. It's nice to try and make things a little bit more awkward than they were before. Great improvement.
and then I'm going to put a custom number format in here. Now this is the same whether it's in Excel or Power BI. You can see here it's hash, comma, hash, hash, etc., etc. And it's got two semicolons in there, which basically these are delimiters that segregate between positives before the first semicolon, negative numbers between the first and second semicolon, and zero after the second semicolon. So hash, comma, hash, hash, 0, 0.00 before the first semicolon is how to format positive numbers. The hash is a special character that says put a number if you need one. The comma says put a thousand separator if you need one. And the noughts mean put a number anyway. Uh, between the first and second semicolons, we've got the brackets hash, comma, hash, hash, 0, 0.00 again. So it just means put brackets around it. Notice it doesn't have a colour there because we can't put colours in the number format. But more on that in a second. And after the second semicolon, we've got the dash for zeros and the backslash just means the next character is text and yes I admit it is superfluous in this point. So this is giving us our formatting. Once we've done that we can go back to the report view and you'll see lo and behold sales cash receipts in the third row have gone negative with the brackets in them. They were negative before but they just look prettier now. Prettier. I'd like to make them red though please. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the formatting and the visualizations pane and I'll just close this values section and scroll down to cell elements and select it to be the one that's negative here which is of course sales cash receipts and then to font color and click on advanced controls and it gives us the font color sales cash receipts the format style defaults to gradient i'm going to change this to a rule based approach and we're going to say if the value is greater than or equal to and i'm going to just going to change this from zero to min and that just means if it's greater than or equal to the min well everything's greater than or equal to the min so it just means that one's going to disappear altogether but i'll change it from percent to number and then it's less than zero well that's the bit we want we want if this number is less than zero and if this number is less than zero we click on red click ok voila we have red numbers with brackets for negatives for sales cash receipts incredible let's just sit back and admire what we've got here for a second this is our control account for sales as i said before sales opening receivables plus the sales less the cash receipts gives us our closing receivables i.e so what's owed at the beginning of the period plus what's come in gives us uh, a total so far then we deduct the cash that comes in to give us what's owed so let's have a look through for quarter one january we have 599 dollars 40 worth of set, uh, sales no cash receipts so we're still owed 599 40 which will become the opening balance for the next period the 2097.90 in february there is the sales to made and we received 239.76 in cash receipts and that gives us our closing total of 24.57.54 which moves on to the next period and so on now, the opening receivables is purely the closing receivables from the previous period. That's why we do the minus one day measure. Remember when we were doing that, that calculation? That's why we've got that in here. So we don't need to put that into our financial statements. If we put our sales figures into the P&L as revenue, if we put our cash receipts numbers as positive numbers into our cash flow statement, and if we put the closing receivable balance into the balance sheet, it has to balance. And that's what we're going to do when we create our outputs, our financial statements, we'll put those numbers in. So we've got these measures, they can just be put in there and the whole thing's going to work. Excellent, eh? Now look, just before we get too carried away, let's just finish off and make this a little bit prettier. I want to get the column headers. So I'm clicking on column headers in visualization. and I'm going to change the background color to more colors. And FFFF is often how I feel when I'm doing modeling. So we'll put a different hex number in here. And I'm going to go for 007, license to kill, of course, 033, which is a nice kind of Excel greenish sort of color. So I have some product color that we have in here. So that's made all the column headers nice and green. And I'm going to make the font color uh, less imaginative white. Looks good so far. The other thing I want to do is change the grid line. You'll see it's kind of blue color at the moment. So I'm going to just go in here and I'm going to change that color from blue to the James Bond one number coloring is 7033 again, which is just what we want. You can choose your own colors. It doesn't matter, but that's just the idea of what we got. So we've got this nice looking control account and that's how we're going to make all our control accounts look when we build our model. OK, so now we've done that, we can move on. And uh, next, you don't necessarily realize that the sales closing receivables is actually um, the summation of those above. So why don't we put a kind of like a line in, which is always a bit awkward. We're going to use an asterisk measure and I'm going to go for asterisk equals. And it's a very exciting measure. Uh, open speech marks, space, closed speech marks. So it's actually going to show nothing. Brilliant. Wasn't that? I think, Liam, that was that was one of the best things ever.
go to drag it down so it's between sales cash receipts and sales closing receivables. Then I'm going to go to formatting and in here I'm going to go down to the specific column section and I'm going to choose the asterisk and I'm going to change the background color to black and you can see lo and behold it makes it a line. I also need to apply it to the header and then it will put it in the other part as well and we now have a line so it makes it look clearer that it is actually a line total that we've put together. It's just a little trick that we use to put these lines in because we find the matrix visualization a little awkward to work with otherwise. Okay and we'll now create another new measure. I suppose we ought to create a gross margin measure might be a good idea. So gross margin equals and as always, it's got to have an aggregation if we're referring to a field. I'm going to use max because I don't like David. And it's going to be max of the gross margin, gross margin field. So there you go. One of the most exciting uh, measures ever. Gross margin equals the max of gross margin, gross margin. Yes, perhaps I could have got a little bit more imaginative with my fields, table names and everything else. But, you know, if you can't have confusion, what can you have? Move that to the control accounts measure place in the home table. I'm going to have another new measure now. So let's create another one. And I'm going to call this COGS. And COGS stands for cost of goods sold. So these are the costs directly related to the sales. So the gross margin is actually your uh, profit divided by your sales, where the profit is calculated as your sales less your cost of goods sold. So we're working backwards to get our cost of goods sold. So that's what we're going to do here. And it's going to equal. Um, uh, in here, we're going to go back to the sales measure we created earlier, and we're going to multiply it by 1 minus the gross margin we've just calculated as a measure. And it's the measure we want, close brackets, we can tick on that, and we have our cost of goods sold. Amazing. So we've got two of those now. Right, what I'm going to do now is copy that visual, so I'm just going to just... Uh, tidy these things up a little bit so I've got a little bit more room. I'm just going to right click on there, have a second version of it so I'm not having to do all the formatting again and I'm using the guidelines to just get it snapped to grid to be underneath and I'll just remove half of these measures in here. I want the asterisk one in here because I want my line. I spent a lot of time sorting that out but I'm going to drag in the cost of goods sold measure that we had before uh, so we've got that in there and now I'm going to insert a slicer. So I'm going to use this to select what my gross margin will be. So selecting the slicer, I'm then going to go into my gross margin table and I can just check on it or I can uh, actually drag it into a field if I want. And I'm going to then go in here and change the presentation type to a list by clicking on that drop down in the right hand corner of the visual. And you can see now, because we're taking the max, we can select different things like, uh, I don't know, let's go for the 0.4, the 40%. That will show you what happens if you select that. Or you can go for 0.6, that will give you 60%. So it's selecting different gross margins. And you can see how that is impacting the cost of goods sold. It's not having any effect on sales, obviously, but it's having it on cogs. I'm just going to resize the slicer and move it up here next to the other matrices. I can also change the way that the gross margin is displayed by selecting the gross margin field in the gross margin table. And I can change the formatting up here from general to percentage. That's looking better. And now we're going to actually do something very similar to what we did before. If you remember, we did sales and then we did sales cash receipts and then we did the two cumulatives of those so we could work out the sales opening receivable, then added them up to get the closing receivable and so on. We're going to do the same thing for the payables. You've seen it once already. Let's add a sheet here. Uh, we'll put a sheet in and we're going to rename this sheet, not page one. I'm going to call it income statement. Then I'll go back to the other sheet and I'm going to take the matrix of visualization and copy the visual and just paste it into the new place here. So we've got it in here and I'm just going to remove the values. I'll keep the asterisk, but I'll get rid of the other ones. So we've just got the line in there for the time being. Let's add a new measure. We're going to calculate our gross profit and we're going to start off by going revenue equals uh, sales. This is just because we want to call it revenue on the P&L, so I'm just showing you how we can just put another one in. Add another measure, and I'm going to call this one COGS IS for income statement, because I need to negate the cost of goods sold. So I'm going to go equals minus, and just make it minus COGS. So I need it to be negative this time, so it, we're going to actually show revenue less cost of goods sold, gives us our gross profit. Speaking of which, new measure, gross profit equals, hard to believe, but it's going to be equal to back in here on the next line we'll type in 
revenue, the thing we've just calculated, and then we're going to bring in our COGS IS, which is already negative, so we add them. So we're putting those through, and now what we'll do is we'll just go in here, and we'll just take in revenue, we'll drag it into the matrix, we'll then take in the cost of goods sold IS and drag that in as well, and then we'll take the uh, gross profit and pile that in. So we've got them in, but of course the asterisk is in the wrong place. We'll just drag that down in the values section of the visualizations pane. Right, now what I'm going to do next, the gross margin slicer on the other sheet, I'm going to copy and bring that in. And it says that once I've done that, let's read that actual dialog box. It's worth actually having a look at here. It's saying, uh, comes up one, one or more of the copied visuals can stay in sync with the visual it was copied from. Do you want to keep them in sync? Yes, we do. We want to be able to actually change the percentage on one sheet to the other, and it just flows through. So we're throwing the kitchen sink at this. And we'll then click on Format and go down to the negative section. We'll go to Cell Elements. It's COGS IS, which is negative. So we'll change the font color to On and go to the Advanced Controls. And our usual rules, if value greater than or equal to min, and it's a number, less than or equal to zero, make it red, yada, yada, yada. All looking good, we've got that sorted out. I didn't do the formatting in the model view, but I can just go to the COGS measure and copy the formatting from here, and then paste the formatting in for each of the measures in the income statement folder. So that's COGS IS, gross profit, and finally, revenue. Let's add another measure now, and I'm going to call this next measure uh, underscore um, equals uh, open speech marks, closed speech marks. So I've got another of these random ones in, and it's just so I can actually uh, create a row. So I'll put that in the control to account measures one. So it's a bit like the asterisk one, but it actually is going to add a, a kind of like a space. Let me show you. When I drag this in, let's drag that down to values underneath gross profits. You see it's put in a row, a blank row, so we can put things in here. Now, I'm going to format that, so I'm going to go to the specific column section, and I'll choose the underline. And I'm going to change the font colour, I'm going to make it white, and I'm also going to go to the background colour, and I'm also going to make that white, so everything's going to be white. I'm feeling all white at the moment. And then we'll apply that to the header as well, so everything goes, and you'll see it's just made everything invisible. So it's added a blank row into our matrix visualization. Now, why is that useful? Well, that means I can now drag gross margin in, for instance, if I wanted to. And yes, it's not formatted as a percentage, but you get the idea it's actually left a row in here. So I could format that as a percentage and put it in if I wanted to, but for now, I'm just going to knock it out. Just wanted to show you. Now, I want to rename COGS IS, so I'm going to click on there and click on the shortcut menu and change it from COGS IS to COGS. So that's where it's going to be in terms of how it displays. So you see now it still says cost of goods sold in there, though it's negative. But if we go back into the income statement, it's still called COGS IS here. So that's a way that you can make it an appearance change, even if uh, you actually uh, have, have still got it called the COGS IS measure. What we've now done then is we've created the first part of a PL. We've got the revenue, we've got the cost of goods sold, the gross profit. And we can, if you think about it, we've also done the cash receipts, we've got the balances. We would put all those into the visualizations for the balance sheet and the cash flow statement as well. And I'm going to be completely honest, a lot of the control accounts are not as simple as the ones I've just shown you for revenue and cost of goods sold. But you can see how I've created the gross profit. And of course, what you would do is you would put the other calculations into the cash flow statement and the balance sheet for the receivables, the payables, etc, uh, etc, et um, and the cash flow receipts and payments. That's what you would do. So the whole thing always balances. And that's what we've done. Here's something we prepared earlier. We've got a book out which actually goes through all this, and some of it is much more complex when we get to inventory, appreciation, tax. But you can see here, I have a P&L, I have a balance sheet, and I have a cash flow statement. I can drill down by product, by a customer, by geography. Now, I don't have all the information, but it doesn't matter. Look, I've got a slicer over on the left-hand side, gross margin, and as if by magic, we can put some more in. I can put one in also for year, and I can put another one in for the actual month name as well. So, Ta-da! We've got these in here. I can pick for putting in for a different year, 2022, 2026, or decide to put them all back in, or go for a month and go for July. And you can see how we can change these things. That's the power of building financial models in Power BI. Tricky, but well worth it if you get there.
got to sign off in some way, haven't I? So if you enjoyed this session, my name's Liam Bastic. If you didn't, my name is Catherine Newitt.